I had a lot of really good books I read last year. Let's see how well I can narrow them down. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Pete and this is The Ponderings of Pete. Thank you so much for stopping by. There is a like button. There is a subscribe button. Uh, there are also that bell notification thing. Cool. If you're coming back, thank you so much. Um, feel free, all of you, to leave comments down below about what you thought about these books. If you read them, do you want to read them? Did I convince you to read them? Because this is definitely not trying to indoctrinate you into cults of Ken Liu. But um, I digress slightly. Let's talk about some of the amazing books that I read in 2022. Lord, time is flying. Note of order that there is none. Well, there's roughly, there's two tiers. There is the first tier and the second tier. Uh, the first five-ish books or whatever are in the bottom five, right? That's as much as I can narrow it down. The very last book I do will definitely be my, the last book series author of the year-ish. Uh, but those other four are like above the first five, but like below. So like think of it's like a countdown, but like the first five are equal. The second four that come after that are equal. And then the top one is the top one. That's as much as I can narrow it down. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Other points of how everything works. One per author. Um, so there may become like levels instead of books. I might do series or just author this year. Uh, we'll see. It's like just trying not to let one author over one list. That's really the intention behind it. First one I'm going to talk about is Babel by R.F. Kuang or Necessity of Violence, an Oxford translator's history of the revolution. Oxford history of the translators, no, an arcane history of the Oxford's translator's revolution, however you want to say it. There's a lot of words that all go together, together in Necessity of Violence and there's a translator's revolution because the magic system is built around translation and it's really cool. Like, I know in my wrap up, I think I focused more on the gripes I had with the book, but I did really love this book. So I'm going to try to focus on the things that I loved here. I think firstly, I think the thematics of this book were phenomenal. Um, despite whatever I, objections I had about character, I think the book worked well as it was. Um, her, I think the theme that she put there, she went hard and accomplished her goal of communicating that theme through the characters, through the story, and she communicated it really, really well. And so, like, this this book is all about that theme of anti-colonialism, trying to get the people who read it to view history almost in a different light. I would argue that the light she is trying to get people to view history in is one that has definitely been to a certain extent, edited out of the textbooks. Or you could also say it has been very much downplayed in the textbooks because we live in a very Western society here in the US. So really honing in on the exploitation of the British Empire of their colonies was a really interesting theme to choose and I really, really did like it. It definitely spurred some research on my own and some conversations with people that um, I didn't necessarily have in history class because these topics weren't entirely discussed. So A plus for thematics and sparking of conversation. And that's why this is on this list. Because it, you know, it made me think thoughts. And I like books that make me think thoughts. The second one is, you know, also included in with the whole Babel thing. And that is Books of Babel by Josiah Bancroft. This is the entire series. I'm just going to put the entire series on here. Um, I think out of all of them, I think four was amazing. I think I think three was probably my favorite, The Hod King, because that one felt one in three were the most thematic and one in four were the most adventure pulp, if that makes any sense. One really delved into the character, the tower as a theme, and then the third book, The Hod King, really focused really, really hard on the injustices of the tower, specifically around the hods or slaves that are within the tower. So those are the two that really made me think thoughts. Um, one in four had four kind of had the best of all the worlds where it had some of that um, focus on the injustice of the towers through the ends of the lens of the characters, as well as just kind of focusing on that adventure, having that adventure pulp feel throughout all of it. You know, the ending is contentious. I think, you know, I do think the if he had gone harder with the thematics of the tower, that the end in that's what you really identified with in books one and three that, yeah, you're you're not going to be 
the biggest fan of the ending. I, I the, the ending leaned a lot more into the adventure pulp side of things than the thematic side of things and kind of left us hanging of, well, what's next? Um, but I felt like it left us hanging in a what's next in a good way of like, oh, there's so many more stories to tell and there's so much more story. And I really hope he delves into that. I've heard rumors that he's going to be doing a short story collection, which is great. And it definitely wasn't, I don't feel like it was one of those things of like, oh, there's so many stories to tell and it's over and it's disappointing. I feel like it's not complete. I feel like it ended on a really good note and just like a, oh, the world is out there kind of ending. So it was really good. And then the next one um, kind of pairs really interestingly with Babel, and that is Lady Trent. Memoirs of Lady Trent I read through Voyage of the Basilisk last year, which is the third one. Yes, the third one. I have not read four, five, and six, which exist. But so, science lady. So take a young lady who has a passion for science a passion for dragons. And, you know, just kind of, she grew up in a Jane Austen type of world, and now she's traveling the world. Really great, really interesting. I really loved Voyage of the Basilisk specifically because it really, uh, the other two books also kind of delve into this, but this one feel like it really honed in on, she comes from a very colonialist empire, right? She basically comes from fantasy England, which is, you know, interesting, which is interesting. You know, it's Jane Austen. So Jane Austen vibes. So of course it's fantasy England. She has this passion just for science, just for dragons. And she doesn't want to be part of the politics of it all. And she unfortunately gets caught up in it more than she wants to. She does her best to walk the line between, hey, can I see your dragons? And honoring the culture that she is in, right? She very much wants to be a part of if she can, but not trample all over everything that the culture she visits holds dear. Um, and that, I think, Mary Brennan writing this really, really did a good job with that, right? Of the scientist who's trying to be respectful and not trying to be just like, ah, I have a right to see the world because it's science and it's all everybody, so I'm going to just destroy everything. Lady Trent has such a compassion for people, despite being a scientist that claims she doesn't like people. She still has such a depth of compassion that I appreciate. And that's why I really love this series. Next up, we have Piranesi by Susanna Clark. I think probably last year's top 10 had Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I hope it did. If it didn't, um, that is much injustice. But Piranesi, I read that this year. And again, Susanna Clark, really great writer. A lot shorter book this time, a lot more focused around the mystery of which what the heck is happening in this otherworldly place. The story behind it all is wonderful. And it's very much a vibey book of just like this mystery and fantastical and like sim there's a simplicity to this book that is such a contrast to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Um, and it really shows her range as a writer. And I really, really hope that whatever's going on with her, with her health, um, I, I know I researched it at one point in time, but it escapes me at this point in time. I really hope that we can see more and more from her as times goes on. I also read The Ladies of Grace Ado. Got a little bit of a taste of going back in the world of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, but I, I do, I am again disappointed that we'll never get back into that world, supposedly, at least with a big sequel that was rumored. I think I will be grateful for any writing that Susanna Clark puts out because of these books, because <laughs> I, 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 it's just, <sighs> her writing is very immersive in whatever she does. She really has a way of words of just really, really pulling you in. I think me, me specifically, she pulls in every time, no matter what she's written. The next series I'll talk about is a, is the first sci-fi series on here, and that is Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee. I will say the biggest thing that really stunned me with this series, specifically in the first book, was the efficiency of the writing. Because these things, these things are small. Like, they're like less than 400 pages. Like 300 pages. Around, they're around, each of them is around 300 pages. And the depth of world building in the first book alone was fantastic and amazing. And the other two books kind of slowed down a little bit and took their time, uh, whereas the, the, the first one felt a little bit more breakneck pace to get where it needed to be. I think the puzzle of the world that was presented by Yoon Ha Lee was excellently presented. It was very much a writing style that was, hey, I'm going to show you these conversations with zero context. And throughout, and throughout this conversation, 
Like there were little clues about what they were talking about that you could eventually put together the conversation, the context of the conversation for what they were saying, but it still felt like they were talking normally. And it didn't feel like they were like, oh, yes, the poison for Cusco, Cusco's poison, yes, mm-hmm, uh-huh. It felt like they were talking about something and you could put the things together based on what they were saying. Like, ah, cool. And then he would actually follow up the important details and confirm them later, right? The really big overarching stuff. So you could really get a sense of like, oh, yeah, I was right. Uh, So that dopamine rush was really great for me in that first book. Um, The politics in this series are really, really good as well. Uh, I really think he uh, explored the psyche of this foreign civilization, this really kind of a little bit, to a certain extent, there's a little bit of an alien part of them because they're, the way their society focuses is very much reminiscent of to me of a clockwork, at least from the top level of things that we saw. Uh, and there's very much kind of touching on how is it right to manipulate your um, citizens uh, constantly on a day-to-day basis. And even if like there's an actual effect of you manipulating them that is, you know, benefits everybody to a certain extent, as well as just having such really in-depth characters that have really focuses on like, okay, there's leadership. And then there's also like the really personal side of, you know, a leader's life Um, in every leader, you know, their personal life will also bleed into their just craziness that's going on around them. And they have to balance that. And, you know, sometimes that might just, you know, who knows, that might bring down an empire sometimes, especially if one of them has been around 200 years and has very personal grudges against specific people. But um, that is a story for another day, a.k.a. Nine Fox Gambit. You should read it. It's really good. I'm really glad I read this. All right. So these next four, I would say a lot of these had a really profound effect on me. And I, th- and I think all of them I really much wanted to uh, read again almost immediately. And I had to restrain myself. The first of these is Augustus by John Williams. This is an epistolary format novel about Caesar Augustus, about his rise to power all the way to when he is not in power anymore. This was really beautiful and the writing was amazing. There were such good quotes in here as well. Again, about leadership. Like, I don't know if you have a constant theme, but I think if any book has really interesting musings about leadership or or like really delves into the psyche of a leader at all, in a good way and not just like, oh, they're a leader. Cool. I think the sacrifices of a leader are really like, if you want to hone in on what hits my, hits my uh, reader nerves of in a good way of just like, oh yeah, that's a good thing to explore. It's the sacrifices leaders make, um, whether it's for the people, um, for themselves, like just like what they have to do, what they have to sacrifice to do what they do. That, that'll usually hit me, especially if you do it well. And I think we got that here. Uh, A lot of most of the book is from perspectives of other people, specifically letters from other people. John Williams was fantastic in this writing. He was really the fact in a few short pages of letters, he was able to draw out these characters. Every letter had such a different voice. It was so beautiful. Uh, Just uh, and Like, I don't feel like I didn't have any idea what was going on, right? Because I'm not a student of Roman history. I mean, Roman history is one of those histories I'm like, "Ah, I'd like to learn more about that someday. But by no means do I know things about Roman history other than, oh, I know who Julius Caesar was and I know how he died. And um, I don't know entirely how he came to power. I know like random things. And I know Caesar Augustus was his, you know, adopted nephew before going into it. And Caesar Augustus outshone Julius Caesar, theoretically. Um. Not theoretically, but he like he did. He grew it like there, there were so many things he did. I knew he did a lot of things. I didn't know exactly what he did. So this is definitely an accessible book if you don't know anything about, you know, Roman history. But and if you're a fan of epistolar novels, you should really read it because it's beautiful. And it's, you know, there's, philoso- there's philosophy. There's just, and of course, it's historical fiction. So like um, one of the things that John Williams said that was really beautiful in the preface was like, look, I filled in a lot of gaps here. <laughs> And the line he specifically uses, if there is truth in this writing, that is the truth of fiction. Uh, that was oh, that was such a line that uh, that feels like a tattoo line um, if I got tattoos of quotes, which I don't think I am. But like, it's such a really good line. Next up, this is going to be a series of series 
That is Realm of the Elderlings. Um, I last year I read Farseer. I read Live Ship Traders. I almost said Lightning Thief, but that's not what it is. I read what's the last one? Fitz and the Fool. So these are the original three trilogies. It was supposed to be a trilogy of trilogies originally that Robin Hobb wrote in the Realm of the Elderlings, and then she wrote the Dragon books, and then. Um, Fits in the Fool trilogy, and I am stupid because I did not read Fits in the Fool trilogy last year. I read Tawny Man. That's the trilogy I'm trying to talk about. So those three: Tawny Man, Farseer, and Live Ships. Wow, the just there was so much, so much emotion, so much torture, um, specifically of like her readers because she likes to put her. I don't know if you knew this, but um, she likes to put her characters through a lot of pain. In order to cause pain to the reader, uh, because she's I she, I don't understand that she like just lives on a farm or something and has like chickens and stuff and ducks. Like she's on the level of John Green, right? You look at the tragedy and just sadness in some of John Green's books, and you're like, wow, you you you're depressed. Are you depressed? Are you okay, man? Uh, and he's such a happy and outgoing and loving and compassionate person and there's a trend there um i think compassion it's hard to write pain without compassion uh especially other people's pain it's hard to write other people pa- it's hard to write pain that has not happened to you without a lot of compassion and empathy if it's personal that's one thing you can write it cool but if it's not personal in order to write it well you have to have those things i think i said that three i think i think i said that the same thing three different ways and i apologize but it's fine anyways Farseer, Tawny Man, really personal to Fitz. Fitz, seeing Fitz grow up, especially between um, Farseer and Tawny Man, seeing the differences between those, seeing Fitz muse on the things that he did in Farseer. I don't know, just seeing a character become self-aware isn't something that you see in a lot of fantasy, being like, wow, I was a dumb, stupid child. Being like, oh yeah, you were. We, I know, I was there. That was beautiful. <laughs> And just seeing everything swirling around Fitz, the politicking, the all the world stuff going on was amazing. And I will say that reading these was further enhanced by being able to discuss them with some wonderful, wonderful people. Um, I had, there was Anitha, there was Evie, there was Derry, and there's a lot of other people um, that I can't, uh, there was Chatty. I'll link them all down below if I can, if I know who I, if I can remember all of them, but like being able to talk with these people, um, specifically Derry, because Derry is amazing and talk through kind of just what's going on. Um, you, you know, just, just being able to like, okay, cool. How can I further empathize with these characters? How can I really, you know, just, you know, feel more pain. <laughs> it was beautiful. Uh, and I haven't talked about life ship yet. I should probably talk about that. Live ship, I think, overall, I think there's still one or two things about the ending that I wasn't as much of a fan of. Um, there's one particular event near the end that I understand. I still didn't like it. And then the fact that I feel like the denouement, the, the kind of like the, the, the falling action, there we go. The falling action of live ship, I felt like should have taken a lot longer. But like, I can also understand because... <laughs> That was a long book already that if you had the, um, the the falling action of, say, Tawny Man, which had like a third of the book as falling action, it would have lengthened the book so, 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 so much. I still wish it had been longer. Like even like a novella afterward would have been great, honestly. I think the things I love about Live Shift, multi-POV. I've always loved multi-POV. I mean, ever since I was first introduced to it, which I can't remember when it was but like i don't know i just i like being able to see a lot of different sides to a story a lot of different sides to the jewel um, that sometimes is a little bit lacking in single pov just that 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 idea of those different facets of the story and that meta and having like a sort of meta narrative when it's done really well it's done really well and i love it love really really love it i i think the exploration of agency of dealing with past generational wrongs dealing with just family issues in general and how to move forward the exploration of change was super super beautiful in live ship and how you adjust and how you essentially you just keep moving forward and you try to do better right you deal with what you can but you keep moving forward you don't stop 
And I think there is a lot. I, I think that was just beautiful to talk about, beautiful to just muse on. Um, and that's really why, why I liked it. Next up, we have another book that caused me lots and lots of pain. And that is Kindred by Octavia Butler. <sighs> this book was a lot of gut punches, right? It's about a woman who unexplicably, inexplicably, goes back in time to the antebellum South 20 or 30 years before the Civil War. Um, and she is on a slave plantation and she is also black. This book was a very raw book, and I still need to watch the TV show. I don't have Hulu right now, so that's mostly why I don't have it. I haven't watched it. I think this was a very good, very, very... The, one, the thing that really like hit me was the exploration of the conflict within a person of survival and um, struggle against oppression, right? When you're put in an unfamiliar situation, your first instinct is survival, even when you are put in a situation where you want to struggle against the oppression you see. The struggle between those two like things within our main character and the realization of how that struggle kind of warps her a little bit and twists her and she doesn't realize how it affects the people around her was heartbreaking. And it's very much a book that you can use as a kind of I, I think anybody could really use it as a mirror of like wow what 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 would I do in a similar situation and not that that would ever happen to you but like I, I think it's a really good book for to just inspire self musing more than anything. And Octavia Butler writes I have a book and I'm definitely gonna read more of her because that was really good. <sighs> All right, next one. I wouldn't say this caused pain. There was more weird glee. I don't know. This one, this is The Company by K.J. Parker. Um, so The Company is about a bunch of people who, a bunch of guys who were in the army of a fantasy world. And this is very, very low fantasy in terms of just like, you don't see any in this world. It's kind of in K.J. Parker's connected world. There is magic, but like, you really don't see it. These guys, right, they're both, they're all basically borderline sociopaths. They're, they're really close to it. At the very least, some of them more than others in different ways. But one of them comes back from the army after kind of just finding a way to get an island from the army and for his personal use. And he's like, hi guys, we're going to go live on the island. And they're like, oh, well, since you say so, okay there. And I enjoyed this because all of them were jerks. I don't know where how else to put it. Um, it is a really interesting look at just the everyday selfishness of people in their situations and just their friendship is not necessarily a healthy one. And there's a big mystery aspect to it all as well. I wouldn't be surprised if KJ Parker was a very pessimistic person from what I've heard, what I've read about him just because he portrays people very, very pessimistically as people that just like, hi, we're out for ourselves and that's it. And people are kind of, kind of bad, kind kind of bad and kind of, kind of going to screw you over, period. Yeah, I, I really, really liked the company a lot more than The Folding Knife, actually. His portrayal of large organizations, whether it be the fantasy church that he has, he has or just the military or bureaucracy, he portrays them very much as just inept, just, you know. A bunch of people getting together, they're going to mess things up. There is an inevitability of just pain as well that comes from these things. Like one of the main characters is, you know, when he was young, his farm was destroyed because there was a battle fought in the, in the, uh, in his farmland and all the sheep were killed and the bodies weren't really, you know, cleaned up very well. Like they were just left there to rot kind of, and they didn't, weren't able to get much salvage, I think from it so they lost the farm it's very much a story about the callousness of life as well a lot of things about the company before we go on to the very final one which i'm sure i'll talk about for an hour the final book series really author um, on my list is ken liu just ken liu i think overall dandelion dynasty definitely top 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 book like oh my gosh i i've talked to so many people about it and i want everybody to read it guys it's so good it's so good 
So I read Paper Menagerie. I read Dandelion, read Dandelion Dynasty. Paper Menagerie. I would put it on the same level as Kindred in the sense that it constantly gave me gut punches and thoughts. Um, just tragedy and a little bit of joy and tragedy and thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and tragedy. And wow, I need to do more research into some things. Uh, that was Paper Menagerie, essentially. Dandelion Dynasty, his Asian epic fantasy story. Like I've, I filmed a review like back in December and I scrapped it because I felt like it wasn't good enough because I want to do this this i want to convince all the people to do things and i rambled about a bunch of things and i want to like oh there's so much ah where do i start okay first of all leadership of course my top book has something to do with leadership like it's such a good portrayal um there's a lot of characters in this book these books this series that really delve into the sacrifices that leaders make and because the, there's a lot of leaders in this these series, they approach, like, Ken Liu approaches this from so many different directions and shows you the different, like, just, just the different scopes and sacrifices that these leaders are made to make or they chose to make and you hate them for it. But you also kind of understand them because they're insanely logical and you're like, wow, but you're, you're not wrong. But, like, um, there's a lot of characters that hate there's or there's there's definitely characters to hate with all of your being and there's characters to love with even more and it is the scope of the growth of a country like you go from basically some semblance of feudalism but i know that's not the right word where you have a lot of tiny kingdoms that are warring against each other sort of there's an empire empire falls then another country rises and we are approaching the era of modernity where we strive for peace and a stable nation. And then other things also happen. And there's engineering. Like one of the things that Ken Liu likes to say, it's an epic fantasy story where instead of wizards, you have engineers. And he explains things. Like, I swear, he built all these things in his backyard before he wrote about them. Except one particular thing, which he kind of like jinxed, jinxed us out on. And I was like, eh. Maybe not everything, but this like, like for background, Ken Liu is a lawyer. He is an engineer. He is a lot of other things. I wouldn't be surprised if he was a straight up wizard as well. Uh, it's that's entirely likely. Maybe a time traveler. It's possible considering some of the stories in Paper Menagerie. Mm. There's so many things like the characters are lovable. I think I, I think I touched on the big things for that. So you'll have to wait for my review to hear more. Um, I still don't know like how I'm going to write it. But I'm going to try. Yeah. Just, I read a lot of good books years this, this year, guys, this last year. And I really hope that 2023 exceeds that by leaps and bounds. I don't know how that I could read a book better than Dandelion Dynasty, honestly. But, like, eh, we'll see. I think that's where I'm going to end it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, let me know if you've read these. Uh, did I convince you to read them? Please. Like, I would love to convince you to read more books and add more to your TBR because that's what I'm here for. <sighs> Anyways, get some rest because like, as usual, I say this because I need rest too, considering it's probably like 1230 because this is when I film now. Maybe. Well, I've always filmed a lot at this time of night anyways, but it is what it is. Get some rest because you, we all need it. Rest is important to make you grow big and strong and eat your vegetables and good night.